I did feel very much like there was a sisterhood with uh, Tammy Wynette and Loretta Lynn and myself. We eventually did an album called Honky Tonk Angels together. So happy now that uh, we had an opportunity to do that. There was not that kind of jealousy. We were all different in our way. We were very similar in our backgrounds, being country girls, brought up poor, but we were completely different to be so much the same, so to speak. Loretta's music was extremely country. Tammy's, uh, she had really great production, things that really were able to cross over, very similar to what Patsy Cline was doing. Mine was somewhere in between. I don't know, mine's just always kind of been dolly music. Some, somehow it had a bit of, bit of country, a bit of mountain, a bit of, you know, the bluegrass, and I still don't know what you'd call my music, just dolly's music, I guess. Don't try to cry. Dolly Parton first hit the charts in 1967 with Dumb Blonde. She wasn't, of course, and that was the point. Like Mae West, she was wittily sending up her own larger-than-life sexiness. Just because I'm blonde, you think I'm dumb, cause this dumb blonde ain't nobody's fool. When you left, you thought... She understands the image she's chosen to project. She understands it, and that's why she can pull it off, because she knows that, that she's the one who's laughing the hardest. I was never intimidated by anybody. I felt like I could just stand right up there with the best of them. It just takes a few minutes for them to see that I'm serious about what I'm doing. Born and raised in Tennessee's Smoky Mountains, Dolly Parton's DNA profile is pure country. One of 12 children, her Appalachian family were dirt poor, but rich in musical heritage. There wasn't so much music on the radio in my very early days. I was more influenced by my family, my uncles and aunts, and those old songs that were brought from England, Ireland, and, and Scotland in the old days brought to the Appalachian Mountains and it's just our, it's just embedded in us. That's just who, who we are and how we expressed ourselves. So that's naturally this music that I think sounds the purest and the realest and that comes out of me the most natural. The success of Dolly Parton's authentic country music went against the prevailing trend towards a more pop-friendly sound. But biographical songs like Coat of Many Colors offered a mix of emotional depth and insight which proved irresistible. Back through the years I go wondering once again. When I started to write Coat of Many Colors, I was traveling on Porter Wagoner's show. And I recall a box of rays that someone gave us. And I don't even really know what made me start writing it. I was just sitting on the bus and the song just started coming out. I recall a box of rags, it just started rolling out, and I was like, wow, this is good. And I didn't have any paper, and I was singing the song, and Porter said, are you just writing that now? And so he had some stage costumes that he had just picked up from the cleaners, and he just jerked the tags off, and I wrote the code colors on the back of his cleaning tags. So with patches on my britches, holes in both my shoes, in my coat of many colors, I hurried off to school just to find the others laughing and making fun of me and my coat of many colors that Mama made for me. Though I couldn't understand that, because I thought, I was rich, and then I told him of the love my mama sold in every stitch. And then I told him all the story that mama told me why she sold and why my coat of many colors was worth more than all their clothes. They didn't understand it, and I tried to make them see one is only poor, only if you choose to be. It is true.
true, we had no money, but I was rich as I could be in my coat of many colors. Mama made for me, made just for me. The classic country stars, the, the original stars of country music, were people who grew up in circumstances where that was what was in their house. They crawled out of the cradle singing this music. It was what was around. That was what Dolly and Loretta and Tammy and these people, that's who they were. It wasn't just what they sang, it's who they were. Then you have in the 1970s a group of artists who were the children of a multimedia age, who look at the banquet of American culture around them and take country music and say, this speaks to me. This is what I choose. It's not what I grew up with, it's what I choose because it's what emotionally I respond to. And there's no one more zealous than a convert. One of the most significant new country converts was Roseanne Cash. As Dolly Parton left Nashville to pursue a movie career in Los Angeles, Cash was putting together a new musical blueprint for country in that same city. It was a style shaped by rock music, with confessional lyrics which went deeper than had ever been heard before. You act like you were just born a night face down. I'm not afraid to say anything in a song. I don't like to say it's therapy because that diminishes it. Then it's just about compulsive confession. And that is not art to me. There has to be a sense of discipline and a talent to make it musical. What was interesting about Roseanne was, as a songwriter, they weren't traditional country songs. They were, they didn't tell direct stories, they evoked stories. And that was an entirely new thing in country music. And prior to that, the, the country song had a very rigid structure as far as what lyrically it did and where it went musically. And Roseanne kind of, in her wacky kind of poetic way, kind of threw that all out the window and, and went into a different space, a different songwriting space that had been gone to before. Roseanne Cash's lyrical country rock attracted a new liberal middle class audience to country. But while she sold millions of records, the male music establishment in Nashville remained unconvinced. I had 11 number one records and I enjoyed every one of them, but I never won a country music award. And you know, there were certain arenas that I was excluded from. It was still very much a patriarchy too. I mean, we were still called girl singers. You know, I, a woman artist was, was like a marginalized group in a way. It was very weird. I mean, I actually had someone say to me, a male, label um, vice president or something, in all seriousness, don't worry your pretty little head about it. Remarkably, Nashville's stereotyping of female artists continued into the 80s. Gail Davis had to fight all the way to become the first woman in country to write, arrange and produce her own work. Back in those days, in the late 70s, when I moved here, Leland Scalar said, when I came to town, women were barefoot pregnant and in the vocal booth, not behind the board. And they didn't say much. I went to a, a thing one time with some uh, 
other females, and we were doing a, a big new faces kind of show. Uh, and all the girls were there with their husband slash manager, husband slash producer. And they didn't talk directly to the musicians. They would lean over and say something, and then their husband would say, well, what she'd like is if you guys could do it this way. And it came my turn, and I was going to do a song that I had written called Bucket to the South, which was a big hit and was played on the Opry all the time. And on the album, the ending, it fade, faded away. And I had uh, uh, an arrangement for the way I wanted it to end, because obviously we weren't going to fade it on stage. And the band had worked up an ending, and so we ran through the song. I got up and played my guitar, and got to the ending, and I said, no, 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 what I'd like you guys is if you, if you instead of that, if you go to the, to the four, and then we'll, you know, and they all, like, just dropped their mouths open and looked at me like, you know, she's telling us what to play. How dare her? And I'd written the song. It was my song. And that was, that really kind of set the tone for the animosity that I felt from a lot of the musicians of that time. Gail Davies clashed again with the good old boys of Nashville when she pulled out of her wedding with local hero Gary Scruggs while pregnant with their child. There was a lot of anger, a lot of animosity. Everybody was, you know, saying you can't have that child out of wedlock in Nashville in the country music establishment, you know, they'll crucify you. And I thought, it's 1982. And it's kind of strange, you know, because right after he was born, I was in the studio, and uh, John Prine had written a song called Unwed Fathers. And it was brilliant. And then uh, I called Emmy Lou, and I said, why don't you come sing harmony on this song? And she came down, it was really high, and she said, no, no, she said, this is a job for Dolly Parton. So we got Dolly Parton down to sing harmony. And it just turned into this magnificent and magical song. In an Appalachian, a Greyhound station, she sat there waiting in the family way. Well, goodbye, brother. Tell mom my love her. Tell all the others I'll write someday. From teenage lover. Somewhere else found a nighttime greyhound. She holds her hand down, singing lullabies. She's scared and crazy. She holds her baby, and says, I think maybe you got your daddy's eyes. Bothered and they run like water. 